All right, hello and welcome from the Crest Butte Museum. Thank you to our live audience and to those who are watching via Zoom for our final episode in our four-part series, Voices of Crest Butte, Past and Present. We turn the tables on those who have made a profession of capturing our prized stories over the decades in the Gunnison Valley. And now we're recording them and all these fun stories for our generations to come. All recordings will be featured on our YouTube channel, Crested Butte Mountain Heritage Museum, to enjoy at one's leisure. It's because of our supportive museum members and our generous donations, we have made it possible to host this program and other educational programming, be it either in person or on a virtual platform. If you haven't renewed your annual memberships or would like to become a member or make a donation, please visit our website at crestedbuttemuseum.com or come visit us here at the museum located on Elk Avenue. Please leave a message or a question in the chat box, which is located on the bottom of the screen. And in the live audience, please raise your hand and we'll share those questions and comments at the end of the interview. Now it's time for today's show, Voices of Crest Butte, Past and Present, presented by the Crest Butte Museum, with Dwayne Vandenbush and Mark Riemann. Thank you very much, Melinda. It's really uh, nice to have Mark Riemann here tonight. Mark, thanks for coming. My uh, first question is, how did a guy from Ohio get to Crested Butte in 1985? What brought you here? Give us a little of your personal history and uh, fill us in on your becoming editor of the Crested Butte uh, News. Well, actually, Dwayne, like you, I was born in Michigan. <laughs> but I spent about a year there and then moved to Ohio. So, and I'm not a Buckeye, just to calm your nerves. Uh, I'm a Bobcat, so I did go to Athens. Um, I got here in 1985. I had graduated from Ohio University in 1981 in communications. I had gotten a job at a local small TV station. So I had worked there for a couple of years, uh, saved enough money, and then took off and traveled for a couple of years. And I got back in the States in December of uh, 1985, spent Christmas with my family. Now tell me about your travels. You told me when we talked a little bit before you were at Kitzbühel, Austria for a while, right? working as a dishwasher. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'd gone from working at a television station as a weekend news anchor to a dishwasher. Uh, and the Austrians that I worked with were baffled by that. But it was a wonderful job and a wonderful experience. I was actually working in Kirchberg, which is the town it would be, uh, it would be like if CB South was was a yeah. bigger town. Where else did you travel in, in uh, around the world? Um, all over Europe. I was in Asia for a year, gone to Australia, New Zealand. I mean, I had just circumnavigated and ended up back in, in the States uh, with no money. And I had a friend who was living in Crested Butte at the time, and he uh, had been working as part of the student program. So CBMR and the Callaways at the time would have students from various Midwest colleges come here for the winter and they would do the grunt work. They were the lift ops and the dishwashers and that kind of stuff. And so uh, my friend Reed was still living here and I found a contact to how to get a hold of him. Cell phones weren't a thing back then. And we uh, ended up, I ended up sleeping on his couch and haven't left. I've, I've left his couch, but not crush the view. So when you got here from, uh, in 85, what were some of the jobs you had before you took over the newspaper? So when I first got here, uh, Reed was working for the kids' ski school. So I was able to get a job doing that. Um, I went to the Grand Butte at the time and uh, was a banquet waiter and a houseman. Um, it, it was though just like everybody. We had two or three jobs um, in the town. And so I was more up in the resort. I was living in Mount Crested Butte, and I was more of a resort uh, ski area, ski bum at the time. And how did you progress? Like most uh, people that work at the newspaper, I uh, was here, and it was like, okay, I'm tired of being a, uh, a houseman and a banquet waiter. And I went to the uh, 
worked up the courage to go into the old Chronicle and Pilot building, which was, uh, it was a, the papers had merged by yeah. then. Yeah. And so it was a small building over on Elk Avenue. And I think it was probably in the spring. I walked in and I, my timing was good. There was Lee Irvin and Sandy Fail, Sandy Cortner. And, uh, you know, hey, do you need a writer? And I'm sure they hear it like we do, you know, a couple times a month. And it was like, well, yeah, what do you do? And it was like, I kind of like hard news. And the whole place just became silent. It was like, what? You don't want to write feature? I'm like, no, you know. It was like, well, can you go cover a meeting in Mount Crest of Butte tomorrow? I'm like, I think, you know, where's the town hall? I'll go find it. And and so I started working as a writer and ended up staying there. I think Sandy Cortner had, had, uh, and I worked together and then she moved on to the Mountain Sun and they needed a photographer. And like so many times you can do in Crest of Butte, they're like, can you take pictures? You're like, you bet. Have you ever developed film? Sure. <laughs> Went to the library, got a book, <laughs> and was developing film the next week. So now you became editor in 2008. Uh, with this iteration of the paper, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the Chronicle and Pilot, I had become editor. There was a group of us that had bought the paper, sold the paper. I had become editor in 96. Uh, myself and Scott Truex and our wives started the Crest of Weekly, which was an entertainment paper. So I was publishing and editing that, did that for 10 years. So that came back into the newspaper world in what is now the Crest of Butte News. And so uh, I've been the editor of the news since 2008. Let me ask you this. Who owns the newspaper? And do you pretty much have complete control about what you want to write and what you want to cover? The paper is owned by a newspaper group out of Wyoming. They have about 20 little newspapers. And the last time I talked to them was probably 2010. Wow. Uh, and <laughs> well, actually, no, there was one time <laughs> I had, uh, there was a kerfuffle, shall we say, with one of the councilmen on Crested Butte. And he had called the owners because they didn't like what I was writing. The owners called me and say, what's going on? And I said, kerfuffle. They were like, fix it. I'll talk to you in 10 years. And so <laughs> that was the last time I talked to him. No, they they have no influence. And, and we, I have a great group of people and we write what we want and how we want it. And yeah. It's perfect. Mark, what are the challenges of being a newspaper editor in Crested Butte, Colorado? Uh, well, you're in a small town. And so when the councilman doesn't like what I write, I got to see him at the post office and I see him in city market or Clark's and on the ski lift. And so, you know, there's that kind of thing, but that's actually probably made me a better editor. I'm a little more tactful than I was perhaps 20 or 30 years ago, a little mellower. And so, um, the fact that you have to live amongst the people that you write about, um, and not everyone does something great. And so uh, you're going to run into them. And that's, uh, that's the hardest part. You know, uh, print journalism is uh, kind of struggling right now. Um, how, many, uh, how many people do you have that subscribe to the Crested Butte News? And uh, how's your advertising? Um, it's gone up and down. Um, I'm just going to you know say that the real estate market has not uh, hurt my salary um, because there is a robust real estate market and pretty much always has been in Crested Butte. Um, I think we have five thousand subscriptions, seven thousand. Wow. I'm not. I'm not in that part of the the business, but yeah, we have quite a few. Um, and you know, people pick it up in town. It's great. Tell me about the major changes that you've seen in Crested Butte since 1985 to 2023, in your opinion. Uh, there's a lot, but um, probably the, the, the number of people that are here and, and the number of buildings in the, in the community. Uh, it was a super small town when I got here. Um, in 85, I think there were probably seven, 800 people living in town. Now there's what, 1700. Mm -hmm. 
I think the two or three biggest things that have made the change, uh, Vail buying the, the ski resort, you know, uh, but that I think was needed. There may not have been a ski resort here now if they hadn't. And I would say that the uh, community school was probably truly the biggest um, change impact in Crested Butte. It, it brought people that um, moved here, can raise families here, felt comfortable and, and solid that, uh, that, that, that it was a real town. And the fact that it is such a good school um, attracted people really from all over the country that they, their kids get a private education and they pay nothing. Claudio Alvarez, Chad Pike, Jeff Hermanson, Mark Walters, uh, million dollar lots, four to five million dollar homes, tremendous wealth in Crested Butte right now. Give me your thoughts on that, uh, how that has changed Crested Butte for, for good or for bad or neutral. You know, there's, I think there's always been uh, wealthy people in Crested Butte. Um, to me, it seems that back in the 80s and 90s, the, the, the wealthy people that were here came uh, because they wanted to meld into a unique, interesting small town community. I think some of the people that are, are showing up now want to build the big houses. They want to show their wealth a little bit more. I don't think wealth in itself is bad. In fact, like I said, I think without Vail coming in to buy the ski area, I know it was on a razor's edge for a while. And I like skiing. I'm glad there's a ski area here. You know, I'm glad this is a tourist town. Um, I, I think that the people you just mentioned um, have concentrated the control of the properties uh, so much. It used to be that there were what, 100 people that own the 200 buildings on Elk Avenue, and now there's six, primarily. Um, and, you know, all those people you mentioned, I've talked to all of them. Good, bad, good bad, or indifferent. Yeah, I know Mark <laughs> Walters. Uh, you've got your number out in the newspaper. You know, I, I know Bill Oberding real well, and on the 4th of July, we were walking down the main drag, and I was heading out after the parade. And I got a chance to talk with Mark Walters for about 10 minutes, but on baseball. Did you give him my number? Uh, he's got your number. <laughs> yes, he does. We didn't, we didn't talk politics. Is this wealth good, bad, or neutral? You know, I, I, I think the proof is in the pudding. I think it's, it's neutral. I know uh, Jeff Hermanson, who is, is not a pauper, has been here for a lot longer than me, and he understands this place. And, you know, he and Kylina have partnered up. They're opening a restaurant that's going to open this weekend. It's, it's great. Um, Mark Walter, I really don't know. I mean, that's, that's my persistent point. I would like to know what he feels of this place and where he wants to take it. Because when it is concentrated in Chad Pike and Mark Walter and Jeff Hermanson, uh, they have, you know, what they do is going to impact me and you and everybody that's in this audience. Do they have an obligation, you think, to uh, share some of the things they're going to do? I do. I think there's an obligation. And in any community, the the business leaders, I think, have an obligation to, to stand up, support the community, and tell us how they are going to do it. We're all part of the community. And, you know, the fact that they have that leverage I think there is even a bigger obligation. You know, the interesting thing is a, a lot of people think that most of the wealth is concentrated in Crested Butte, and it is. But a lot of people don't know that Ray Davis, the owner of the Texas Rangers, who won the World Series this year, has a big ranch right across from Juanita Hot Springs. I did not know that. And I, and I don't know what he's worth, but it's worth a lot of money. And, uh, you know, he's had a big impact or will have a big impact from what I understand uh, in the future. Uh, tell me about second homeowners. Um, how many of them are there in the Crested Butte area and what uh, what kind of things do they bring to the community? I, I would have no idea what the number is. I, I really don't. You know, I'm sure there are thousands up and down the valley. Um, I think the second homeowners are a a uh, strong part of the community. Uh, I mean, from back in the 80s and 90s, I said that, you know, you had tourism, you had locals, and you had second homeowners that were kind of the legs of the stool that made this place work. 
And the fact that those guys can come here and gals and families and, and they support this community, they love it. You don't buy here. You don't come here unless you love this place. And I've always appreciated that. Um, there was the kerfuffle during COVID with second homeowners, which I think some of them blew out of proportion and didn't seem to understand that that was a unique situation. And they didn't seem to have any understanding of how everyone was doing their best. And a couple of them just fell back on the private property rights mantra. When they were, is that when they were asked maybe to stay away during the coronavirus? Mm -hmm. It was, but again, remember at that time, no one knew what yeah. You know, the virus was doing. No one knew what the results were going to be. And they just had this um, entitlement that they own the property there and they can fly in on their jet, go to the hospital if they want, because they'd have to stand in line in Houston. And it pissed me off. Give me a capsule view. <laughs> Give me a capsule view of an of a uh, of a second homeowner, an average second homeowner. Where do they come from? How much money do they have? What brought them here? And what do they bring to the community? I think it's changed over the years. I think back in the 80s and 90s, again, I think there were people that were owned second homes and you didn't have to be a multimillionaire to do that. And a lot of them came from Texas and Oklahoma. Um, you know, the, so, so they came in because they really enjoyed Crested Butte. I think uh, in the 2000s, there are more of them that they want to find a, a unique mountain resort town or they just want to be in the mountains. And you have to have more wealth. I mean, like you said, there are lots in Crested Butte now that are a million dollars. That's that's not surprising anymore. That's what it is. Do many of them work from home? Uh, uh, there are people that live here that that do work from home. And, and that's, you know, I think, especially with COVID, I think people understood that they can do that. And same thing. I think they bring value to the community as well, because they can be here, they can enjoy the amenities that we have, but they also contribute to Crested Butte. No, I asked Sandy Fails this question. And she, she brought up a, a great theme in her book, The Edge of Par Paradise or the Road, uh, The End of the Road. We got four major national uh, wilderness areas that surround us. Uh, there's only one road in and out of Crested Butte in the summertime, and only two roads in and out in the uh, in the wintertime, and then two roads in and out in the summer. What kind of an impact has that had on Crested Butte and the people who live here? Um, I think it's it's a big part of what makes this place what it is because it is the end of the road. And so when you come here, you know this is it. And if you will, it's the low road less traveled to get here. And so, you know, people that find themselves at the end of a road are a little odder if they stay, a little weirder. And there's a certain community that, that feeds on itself because uh, once you're here, you're kind of here. You know? How different are they? You said a little weirder, what do you mean by that? Well, look out there. Incidentally, <laughs> I want to mention we have the current mayor of Preston Butte here, Ian Billick, and the ex-mayor of Preston Butte here, Jim Schmidt. So we're we're that's delighted. exactly who I was talking. About. <laughs> we're delighted. We're delighted to have them here. Um, Mark, I prepped you with this a little bit before. Um, uh, Crested Butte, uh, give me the advantages of young people, young children growing up in Crested Butte. You had a couple of kids, uh, Sam and Ben, I know, and uh, maybe the disadvantages of growing up in Crested Butte, if there are any. Well, I, th I think, you know, you ask any kid, especially in that, so they, they were born in the 90s, and so they were in school here and were able to do 12 years. And uh, their class sizes, I wanna say, were 28 for Ben, maybe 31, 32 for Sammy. And, uh, you know, one, they couldn't wait to get out of the small town and go see what was out there. Um, they both came back, you know, and they dispersed a little bit. But if you ask them, I mean, you know, I mean, being a high school kid, and the same 20 other students are next to you, and half of them are girls, and you've known them since you were in diapers, and it's like, this is it? <laughs> you know, I think that would be rough on a kid. But as far as growing up here, I mean, you get 
the fact is what you said. It's the end of the road. People are a little stranger. They think out of the box. You're outside all of the time and you're exposed to, you know, the wilderness. You're exposed to art. I mean, Crested Butte is interesting because as small as it is, it's a very cosmopolitan place. And that's in part because of the tourism element. And that's great. Yeah, you know, one of the things we talked about with Sandy last week is that Crested Butte, uh, of course, their school is tremendous. Gunnison County is the eighth most affluent county in the United States out of 3,143. That's because of the university and people with mm-hmm. master's degrees, uh, you know, slinging uh, hamburgers right. and, and uh, being bartenders and so on. So it's a, it's a tremendous place. While we're at it, we want to give a little shout out to the uh, Crested Butte State Champion uh, soccer team. <laughs> That's right. That had a today today. <laughs> and picture taken on top of Monarch Pass, a one to nothing win. And they had a lot of tight games, but they have uh, they, they've done very well. Um, you know, I, I always tell people I came here from Michigan. I'm glad I didn't grow up in the Gunnison country because it would have been very difficult to leave. Mm-hmm. Um, the whole nation is kind of polarized right now. Blue, red, conservative, liberal, whatever. Um, Colorado, in some ways, is not as much. Uh, you had an editorial last week about... Uh, the uh, polarization with regard to a recall position up at Mount Crested Butte. I want you to comment on that and and give us the gist of what you were saying. And I think I it was a great editorial. I thought, give us the gist of that. So one of the town councilmen uh, uh, sits on the Mountain Express board, and he's the chair of the Mountain Express board. And the Mountain Express has decided to eliminate one of the condo loops and instead have an on-call system uh, called Downtowner, I think it's called. They're, they're calling it First Track. And the people that the condo loop served on Paradise Road uh, were upset that the condo loop was going away. And I've talked to, to Roman, who was the councilman, and I, you know, I, I think he made some errors in his judgment in, in getting out there to try to talk and explain what the situation was going to be. But these people that are um, upset took it to a point where they, which I've never seen in this community, I don't think, but they filed a, uh, they circulated and filed a valid petition for a recall election. And that will, the date of that will be determined at the next Mount Christ of Butte Council meeting. And to me, that just um, is a little bit too much of the polarization that you were talking about. You You wanted to wait for the election. I think that's the proper way to go. If if a councilman is being uh, totally unethical or has his hand in the till. Yeah, you recall and you take the proper steps. I think this is a step yeah. too far. Is Crested Butte a difficult town politically? It's a, it's an interesting one, and it's a you know it can be a uh, interesting one, <laughs> but um, no, it's great. And, and to me, what what I've always appreciated, I was on the town council with with Jim for four years, and what I always appreciated was that you could have these very, very intense, robust debates over an issue and over things that we were trying to do on the town council. But at the end of the day, you would go out and buy each other a beer. I see less and less of that happening now. So I do think that it's probably more difficult to be in politics. I mean, Ian and his council are doing some interesting things that isn't... um, popular in some quarters, but so far I haven't seen a recall election for, you know, for, for them. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. Colorado State Supreme Court ruled, and you had this in one of your editorials, mm-hmm. that you cannot identify people who want to ban books in a library. Comment on that. And now this is nationwide. There's a lot of this going on nationwide. Mm-hmm. Um, give me the gist of that editorial again and why you think they should be identified. So there is, we are actually in the, and we're taking that uh, situation to the Supreme Court of Colorado. Um, the, the Court of Appeals this summer ruled that um, the, the petition that we had put in front of the court, that when somebody fills out a, a, re- a 
uh, a form at the library asking to ban books or move them within the library, that we should be able to know who is doing it. And there is a Colorado statute that says users of the library can remain anonymous. And the as we looked at it, the intent was, and I agree with, I should not be able to find out what book you are taking out from the library. I totally agree with that. We are arguing that if you are filling out a form and asking for a policy change with the library, you're not using the library. You're trying to prohibit my use of the library. Makes perfect sense. So far, the courts have shut us down <laughs> twice. <laughs> Is this where it ends? Um, it, it will end with the Supreme Court. And I believe this week we filed a uh, certificate saying that we were going to make the appeal. The, the funny thing is, and the judges can't quite wrap their head around it, is that uh, the, the suit is Brookhart or Riemann versus Brookhart. And we get to these to the courts and we are basically on the same side. We're arguing the same yeah. points and the judges can't quite figure out yeah. why. There's no V in the It's Brookhart and Riemann, you know, in this one. One of the things I've always thought is that uh, everybody in Crested Butte from four to 80 is a great athlete. Kayakers, skiers, mountain bikers, extreme skiers. Um, tell me a little bit about that. And, and while we're at it, um, the women of Crested Butte are remarkable. When I, when I go home and tell my sister on the farm in Upper Michigan what we do, not me, but what people do in Crested Butte, mountain biking, skiing, and so on, they think we're crazy. <laughs> tell me about that a little bit. Tell, tell me, tell me what you, how you feel about that. How has that made this a real unique community? You know, I, I think that, um, that that is definitely one of the elements that makes this place special. And there are some fantastic uh, athletes, you know, Emma Coburn and, and Aaron Blunk. But, you know, they've been in the Olympics. They're, you know, they, they are standouts. Um, I like to think of myself as a recreational athlete unless I go back to Ohio and walk around the mall and then. I'm pretty good. <laughs> you know? Here, I'm not so good, but at least I get out on my bike and I ski. But uh, be, I think being in the outdoors and being an athlete is is kind of part of the culture of this place. And not everyone does it. I mean, um, Linda Jackson, I don't think I've ever seen her on skis, but her, you know, her creativity and her artistic prowess is what kept her here. What is the current relationship between Mount Crested Butte, Crested Butte, and Crested Butte South? Um, I think it's uh, pretty good. I mean, there there were times um, when I've been editing the paper that Crested Butte and Mount Crested Butte really disliked each other. And uh, it was very easy to categorize Mount Crested Butte as the Republican business people and uh, Crested Butte is the, you know, hippie, you know, wackadoodles. And somehow they both fund Mountain Express and it works. But I think now I, th I think there is a uh, common bond of what it is um, that this place has become because it, it isn't what it was 30 years ago. And, and there, you know, there's more acceptance of the tourism element, both down here and up there. And in CB South, see, you know, CB South is kind of where a lot of the people left Mount Crested Butte and Crested Butte uh, to raise families because that was more affordable there. George Sibley made a great point a couple of weeks ago. He said that if you're living above 8,000 feet in this area, you are a Democrat. If you're at 6,000 feet uh, or so, or maybe below 8,000 feet, you're a Republican. I thought about that, and I thought that was pretty interesting. <laughs> That's a pretty, pretty interesting observation. I think it's a great observation, but don't tell Joe Fitzpatrick so, uh, <laughs> or Vince Rogowski. Uh, tell me the impact of uh, Vail owning the Crested Butte ski area, and how are they doing right now, and where are they going? Um, I have no idea, and I'm not sure they have an idea, <laughs> you know, Crested Butte Mountain Resort, uh, you know, was kind of part of the package when the Mullers sold them uh, with Okemo and Sunapee. Mm -hmm. And they'll, you know, they wanted those East Coast resorts. And the Mullers were like, you got to take this. <laughs> and they'll, um, from what I can see, 
they look at most ski areas uh, similarly and they want it to be family friendly and you know blue runs and everyone's you know kind of normal and happy and come here for with your epic pass for a week and that's not what Crest of Butte is and so i'm not sure and if when they watch this on youtube they're going to hate it but i don't think they get this place yet and maybe they will but um I, I don't see them understanding what this place is, but I'm glad they're here because they have the funding to keep it going. Tell me the major challenges or problems that you see facing Crested Butte today. Um, I think the first one would be employee housing. Um, that was one of the great things about Crested Butte was that it was a real town and, and there was economic diversity. You know, when I got here, I was able uh, you know, rent was cheap. I was able to buy a piece of land and build on it. And, and so we've been able to, Diana and my, uh, myself have been able to raise a family here. And um, I think that's a challenge for every resort. Now, Crested Butte, to its credit, uh, because we've been talking about it for 20 and 30 years, I want to say just under 68% of the houses in Crested Butte are occupied by people who live here. And if you look at that same demographic in a Vale or a Breckenridge, it's closer to 30. And so we still have a vibrant community. It's lacking a little bit. And, you know, you can't come here and get a job as a kid's ski school instructor and a banquet waiter and buy a house like I was able to. Um, but, you know, the, the towns... And the county are all trying to figure out ways to allow that to happen. And, and they're, I mean, they're seriously focused on that, which is, which is great. They had an article in the Wall Street Journal today about Vail and Nantucket uh, working on, on low-cost housing. You know, it's, uh, are we going to be able to solve that? Are we going to be able to allow people who do the work bartenders, construction workers, plumbers, electricians, carpenters, are they going to be able to live in Crested Butte? Some of them, um, and, and some of them will, will be able to do it because, you know, their parents will help them, and, and it's going to take more help than it would have. The town of Crested Butte should soon have, you know, a 100-unit uh, development over there by the Gas Cafe. The county uh, has got 230 units planned. And so, you know, that's that's a fair amount of, of affordable housing. You know, it's going to be deed restricted. It's going to be, you know, come with some strings. But yes, that that'll is where what it would be. Mark, tell me the names of those again. You're talking about Whetstone. I'm talking about Whetstone and what do they call it? No, no, Mineral Point. A mineral. Yeah, yeah, yeah min, Mineral Point. Okay, Sixth good. and Butte. <laughs> um, tell me, uh, define for our audience deed restricted. So if you are able to either buy or rent in one of these uh, government subsidized houses, you're going to be limited on any equity that you're able to make. And so uh, I've been lucky because I have a free market house. And so, um, you know, I, I was able to tap into that when my kids went to college. It's going to be harder if you're in a deed restricted house. And so when you go to sell, you have to sell to a certain pool of people that, that meet the same qualifications, whether they work here X amount of weeks over the year, whether you make X amount of money you, you know, underneath. And so the, the restrictions that are on the deed determine who is eligible to live in those. You know, historically, uh, Gunnison and Crested Butte, there's always been a big rivalry. Mm -hmm. And in the old days, it was the Anglo, primarily ranchers, with the money in Gunnison against the uh, Catholic immigrant coal miners. And the money was up there, down there, and it wasn't up here. The worm is now turned, and most of the money is up here. Uh, I know, you know, I had one of the friends tell me the other day, well, I haven't been in Crested Butte in 10 years. Do you still see that rivalry, that, that division between the two towns, or has that lessened a little bit? Oh, I think it's lessened a lot. I, re <laughs> I remember when I had gone down to, uh, when I was a photographer and was shooting Cattleman's Days, and the announcer was, you know, making fun of 
crusty butte hippies and he can smell the patchouli from down there and <laughs> it's like wow okay <laughs> you know look where i'm going back to my car and um you know there, there's still a bit of that rivalry and um but there are so many people that i know personally that have moved from up here to down there i think that gunnison uh incredibly has gotten less conservative crest of butte with some of the people moving in has gotten a little more conservative now we're still more liberal up here but i think that the division is is the division gap is closing you know out of the uh, 17,000 people living in the county about six or seven thousand now live in the north end of the uh, mm-hmm. of the county which is kind of in we got about five minutes to go here mark so rapid fire <laughs> is the amax mine on mount emmons dead it's on life's not even it's on death support it's <laughs> we're getting closer and closer and and uh we're it, it's closer than it ever has been and i don't think it's that much of a threat anymore there are no stoplights in the east river valley are there any in the offing that's where the roundabouts come in uh, that's, that's a whole question. different <laughs> okay where are the roundabouts going to be if they are put in if they if they are going to be put in short term it would be over at uh red lady and and the highway by the school and and you know the studies are being done the council has that under consideration and that seems to be where it makes most sense long term it would perhaps and we're talking years and years down the road it would be one at the four way and then maybe even beyond. Tell me the status currently of the post office. <laughs> I have no idea. The, the council was kind of uh, uh, last week informed that the, the partnership that they thought they had to build a new one when the one on Elk Avenue, when the lease runs out, they're going to build one across from Gothic Field. And they were informed that the post office is maybe less enthused than it was a month ago and so it's it's a mystery yet unless ian has information that i'm not aware of and he's shaking his head no <laughs> well i think we're about finished uh, mark this has been absolutely delightful i've uh, i've learned a lot i think our audience has probably learned a lot we have a lot of people on zoom and i'm gonna have melinda now i guess i'll just ask are there any questions from the audience we got a pretty good uh, house here to, uh, today <laughs> jim give me the question and i'll repeat it okay um a lot of people probably don't know that mark does not record meetings he writes everything longhand and then puts it into articles What's the biggest screw up you did that you misquoted somebody over the years? I mean, <laughs> the thing you can remember. The question is: Mark takes uh, minutes or writing by longhand. What's the biggest screw up you had after doing that? I, you know, I honestly don't think I've had a big one. Uh, going back to that kerfuffle, one of the council members thought I did, and he was mad because I put an and instead of a but or something. It was that. <laughs> minuscule even though it didn't really change the thought but i'm so far so good and to me it's like watching a play and then transcribing it any other questions from the audience yes sir i really enjoy reading your editorials and i was wondering if you could speak to what what role do you think they play in our community and where have they had like the, the biggest impact Positive, negative, neutral. Question is, what role do your editorials play in Crested Butte? How much impact do they have? I, I don't know. You'd have to ask the other people. I mean, I, I, I have the privilege of throwing out an opinion pretty much every week. And I try to make them so that there's a logical argument. and maybe persuade someone to take a different look and i've done it long enough that i think there are some people that uh, appreciate what i write and you know the uh and candidate endorsements that i make but it's one man's opinion looking into the future i'm sure a lot of people would feel the same way i do i hope that you are going to remain editor of the crested butte news for some time in the future have you thought about that well, it doesn't pay very well, so I have to keep working. <laughs> and I like my job, so good. I do like it. Catherine, a question. 
Do you think Mark Walters is ever going to call you? <laughs> Do you think Mark Walters will ever call Mark Freeman? <laughs> I have my doubts. I mean, mutual acquaintances says he's a great guy. I personally appreciate that he's got the funds to save the Forest Queen building, but I don't know if that's in his, uh, how he does things. And I really don't think he cares what I think he should do. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, when I met him on the 4th of July, uh, I was very impressed with his humility. He seemed like a very decent, decent mm -hmm. person, you know. Other questions? We have another hand. Yes, sir. So... <clears throat> Part and parcel kind of segueing from the last question and the discussion about the wealth that's coming in, and in particular the six or so that more or less have all of the downtown now. Um, it seems to me that if people come here, wealthy or not, right, one of the things that brings them here is what Crested Butte is. And so I would hope that you wouldn't want to come in then and change what was you know exciting for you and brought you here so to that point i guess I'm, I'm saying i've always felt like that something like this you know these get-togethers where these kinds of things and obviously the people um the passion you know for this place it just exudes you know from every every person and every conversation and every glance and every look in here so i, I always felt like that if people coming in would have a way to to uh, understand, you know, and like come to a place like this, come to a meeting like this or a presentation like this and experience it, that they would be more uh, understanding and able to embrace. All right, that's not really a question. Sorry for the, <laughs> that's all. the question is this, um, can the newspaper then perhaps provide a, a portal or a window for people coming in to when they read the paper, they read about these things and, and the, the personality and the history in addition to the other things that are there. So is that possible, maybe, that the, the newspaper could help in that regard? Yeah. Maybe? But the question is, uh, when, when new people come in here, they come in here for a certain reason and uh, probably shouldn't try to change it as much. And, and the question is, is there a vehicle in the paper that might be able to explain a little of that? Well, I, th I think I like to think that the newspaper uh, kind of does that every week, you know, and so you get my sometimes pointed opinions, but you get the profiles, you get the Titans winning the 2A soccer championship, you get the events that are coming up. So I think we try to portray what this community is about, and some weeks are more successful than others. And I've always thought, and I should write this, but um, if somebody buys a piece of property in Crested Butte, part of the deal is you have to spend a day with Glow. <laughs> and that way you will you will understand what this place is about. Very, 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 very good. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Any questions from the uh, Zoom? They're just absorbing it. I think that we are. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's been a wonderful group here, a very big group. And Mark, uh, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom and keep up the good job on the paper. Thank you, Dwayne. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> We'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Sandy Cortner, George Sibley, and Sandy Fales for participating in our new series. Voices of Crest Butte will continue in May of 2024 with a new theme, so stay tuned. The information will be located on our webpage as well as in our monthly newsletter, so sign up at CrestedButteMuseum.com. We have a few other events that are coming up, including our holiday raffle that just kicked off for the month of December. We have the Wild West Murder Mystery with the Malarty Theater on December 2nd. Tickets are on sale now. And Santa will be visited, visiting us on December 16th with the Polka Party on December 28th with Pete Dunda. The virtual series with Van and Bush will begin again in January on January 2nd. December 1st, we will launch that so you can sign up on the link. So once again, visit our webpage for all our upcoming information. Thanks to our members, thanks to our donors, our supporters here at the museum, and thank you to our people who participated in the series. Yeah. Thank you, Melinda. <laughs> Mark, great job. Thank you, Dwayne. Yeah.